Hal Sharma. On behalf of, behalf of HPNI, I would like to welcome Dr. Mitra Vasu Chiller, who is also one of my very good friends and well wishers. Talking about the introduction part of uh, Dr. Mitra Vasu Chiller. Uh, Dr. Chiller is basically MBBS, MD, Medicine, and MBA in Healthcare Admin. He was earlier posted as, as Scientist G in DRDO. He has worked in various domains of uh, CBR and disaster management, wherein he is a trained gold commander, multi agency, gold strategic CBR and command course of Polish National Center at Wrighton Coverty, UK. He was also the faculty of biological warfare at uh, National Disaster Man Authority, a trained Six Sigma quality manager from ESI, ESIC Hyderabad, and panelist for Lok Sabha TV for Healthy India program. He got Best Paper Award in 20th Annual Conference of Association of Physicians of India held at Hubli, Karnataka. He was commended by Dr. Debel for high scientific contribution made by self in developing a cardio risk analyzer while carrying out the medical evolution. Talking about the CBRN part, he is one of the most renowned faculty of CBRN, particularly for biological disasters. He was very much associated with NDMA in mass, DRDO and various other bodies for uh, delivering the talks, devising new equipment and giving commendations for this particular. He also started his career as junior resident, Department of Casualty, New Delhi. Then he worked till July 2013 as a scientist F. He was a member of FMS Alumni Association member of Association of Physicians of India, member of Research Society for Study of Diabetics in India, and member of Indian College of Cardiology. So you all will be very much be benefited by the experience which Dr. Chiller has. And uh, it would be very helpful and interactive session talking with uh, Dr. Chiller. And uh, hope you all will enjoy the talks delivered by Dr. Chiller. So with this, I would like to welcome Dr. Mitravasu Chiller to start his uh, talk. Mr. Chiller, sir? Yes, sir, we can start. OK, so we can start. Thank you. Yeah. So welcome all to another enlightening session on our ongoing CBRN course. So I believe this is your first session on biological part of CBRN. CBRN, as we already know that it is chemical, biological, radionuclear. Uh, is an acronym for uh, these uh, four terms. So this is your first lecture and uh, this is slightly atypical of uh, such courses, uh, like usually when we hear the word CBRN, we think of some acute emergencies, some acute problems, some acute attacks of some agent or something happening suddenly, like we still have got the memory of uh, Bhopal gas tragedy or Hiroshima Nagasaki bombing, like we tend to believe that uh, the CBRN attacks, they happen just suddenly and suddenly there will be some outbreak or some disaster happening and then you have to manage and that disaster or that outbreak or that destruction happens because of non-conventional weapons 
and uh, then you have to make immediate response, curtail that, prevent secondary disaster, and uh, regenerate, and then mitigate. But here is another aspect of uh, CBRN which defies this law of equity. So uh, this is called biological disaster or biological attack or bio warfare or bio uh, the attacks by bio agents something like that. So before we actually enter into how these biological agents they can devastate human and plant life or, or, or the life of other biological forms. So let us delve into the basics of uh, this biological universe or commonly called as biosphere on this planet Earth. So why this lecture again or why even this series of lectures to, to all of you? So one of the con philosophy of life is a thing which we are afraid of. We try to prepare against that. We are afraid of uh, going hungry, so we earn money. We are afraid of uh, getting affected by the nature's elements like cold or uh, heat or uh, torrential rains. So we build our houses to protect us ourselves. We are afraid of uh, getting alone in our life, lonely, so we build relations, we get married, we produce children, we, we make a family and uh, live into the, in the comfort of the family. So under deep psychology, there is something called, is something called a fear, fear driven actions. So why is this course to you? So sincerely, it's a sincere question. Ki are we afraid of something as a country, as a society, as individuals? as uh, such a, uh, as a huge demographic uh, group of uh, this part of uh, the earth. Are we afraid of something? That's why we are trying to prepare ourselves. So what would be your answer? i just give a little pause here and uh, let you think about this question. Ki why this goes to you? Is it that we are scared of something? Okay. So, I would expect a yes from you. I would say yes, please accept that we are scared, we are afraid, we are afraid of something unknown. A thing, again, a thing which you know in and out about it, you may not be afraid of uh, that thing. So your, this uh, fear factor comes down because now you know, know you know how to mitigate it, think how to prevent yourself uh, from that threat, how to get rid of that threat even or how to get rid of even the possibilities which will, uh, those conditions which will uh, raise the possibilities of happening that threat in your life because you know that, you know the technology, you can, uh, you, you know the basic mechanism so you can apply, you can develop or you can apply the technology of label to get rid of uh, that threat. A thing which you don't know, which is obscure. So you have to be afraid. And uh, not only afraid, we should say, you should rather cross question to me why we should not be afraid. This. And lastly, I would declare that, and this we have seen in uh, our COVID outbreak or the pandemic which happened uh, started in 2019 and uh, in 2020 India as a country also got sensitized how to prevent COVID spreading from one to another by basically two main modalities one is everybody was says uh, everybody said that do gaj ki duri or mask bhi zaruri but you must have seen many people who said, Koi fark nahi padta. I will not put any mask. I will uh, keep on intermingling with people. So these are those fools. They were not afraid. They were, they were, they projected themselves as uh, like mighty beings. But were they mighty? Were they brave in true sense? Answer is no. They were just fools. They were ignorant. 
sometimes these ignorant people they tend to project themselves or we project them as brave people because they they are just not aware of the threat they are putting themselves and others into that so we have to need to be very cautious about it if we actually value our life limb or property okay so i was just surfing the internet for uh, to prepare this lecture and uh, i happened to come across with this particular news an article rather i should say a fantastic article and uh, i have just taken a screenshot to show it to you and screenshot clearly says terrorist likely to conduct biological attack by 2020 and there is an intelligence report which wants that yes somewhere by year 2020 there will be some they have used the word terrorist because uh, if it is a see we are in attack I, most of them they are it's done by terrorist people who want to terrorize you so if somebody will actually attack you by the year 2020 this is not important that uh, they have predicted this year 2020 unless we understand that this, this prediction was done in 2005 about 15 years ago that thing and we all know if not a biological attack we, we don't know whether it's, it was an attack or not we don't know it was an accident we don't know it was freak accident of nature per se we don't know nobody knows one day the answer will come but we all know that a huge biological pandemic happened in year 2019 if not 2020 so how accurate are these predictions or these forecastings in uh, scientific field are uh, in past 2 3 decades how accurate are these predictions so we should we should respect the science behind it so okay so uh, that was the preamble so let us come to some facts of uh, our biological forms we all have heard the name bacteria so just to tell you bacteria they are uh, everywhere around us inside us over us like in, over our skin our skin is covered with this bacteria our gut inside our intestine every we have got a lot of bacteria and they say we have got 10 times more in number of these bacteria than our own cells in our system so i don't know how many trillions of cells our system we know our bodies are made of cells so maybe many many trillions of the cells we are uh, this they shape uh, our human form but scientists they have calculated that 10 times in number the bacteria we possess in bacteria and uh, 10% of our body weight is made of bacteria like roughly if, suppose if i am 75 kg so roughly i can say about 7 to 7 and a half kg of bacteria only i am carrying and not only me you all are carrying 10% of your body weight as the weight of the bacteria is themselves then this slide shows the bacteria uh, they are just like universal lamination everywhere around us whatever we see the, these all these surfaces are covered by some or the other type of bacteria so this is nature we can't get rid of these uh, microscopic life forms single cellular life forms we call them bacteria but nature has given this small life form in the form of these cells and has covered itself in and out so even so important is this layer of bacteria to keep us healthy and disease free that we all the time 24 hours a day 365 days in a year we all need uh, you can say the coverage or the exposure to these healthy bacteria around us we cannot live in isolation like in a totally aseptic Uh, room if there is a clean room totally septic we kill all the bacteria and we try to live inside the room we will go ill we we'll fall ill 
we will not be able to survive for long. We need these bacteria around us. So these bacteria are very helpful. They somehow they keep our immune immunity or body defense mechanisms in check. So we have to understand that that bacteria, 99.99999 percent, these small biological forms are not our enemy. They are our, not only even friends. They are essential for us to be living as human beings in this body. They are essential things. So. And uh, there is a company, this another uh, internet search I could find out that there is a company who is, who just like uh, does the business of covering our building and surfaces with these healthy bacteria. Right? They will come with this, with some solution, with this spray and they claim that they have cultured good bacteria. They will come to your house, they will come to your office, workplace and, with, and for a, uh, for an amount for a business amount, transaction of money, they will spray those bacteria in on the, those surfaces and claim that they will take care of the disease causing bacteria. So this situation is something like this, you understand. Like there is a mohalla, there is a mohalla of there are many, maybe hundred houses uh, in a mohalla and uh, everybody is living in there, these houses, there is a family and something happens, uh, some some threat happens, some disaster happens and 90 houses go vacant. So they will remain vacant for one year, two year, three years, somehow they, they are deserted. But then some anti-social element will start making these houses their abode. Those uh, thugs and uh, anti-social elements somehow, somehow they will start coming into that mohalla and making those houses as their own abodes. So this is uh, akin to that. This is uh, comparison to that. Ki if these healthy bacteria is not around us, then other disease causing bacteria, maybe tuberculosis, maybe typhoid fever, bacteria for typhoid fever, these bacteria or maybe for uh, pneumonia or the bacteria which cause a lot of skin infections or throat infections, they will start settling themselves around our our, uh, our ourselves in, in or our desk or walls or something like that. So to get rid of those disease causing bacteria is important that our surroundings are full saturated with normal non-disease causing or helpful bacteria. So, coming back to the word, the meaning of, uh, understanding the meaning of biosphere word which I used two slides ago. So, we can say the biosphere, it is one of the Earth's four primary zones or compartments. Like that we call, if, if air is there, we call it atmosphere. For water, we call that part of the Earth as hydrosphere. When there is uh, there are uh, other uh, solid structures like uh, stones, we call it lithosphere. So these are interconnected zones where life flourishes. So spanning the Earth's atmosphere, hydrosphere, and lithosphere, this biosphere serves as the critical habitat where living organisms can thrive. So this intricate web of life it encompasses all living creatures from tiniest microorganisms to the grandest life forms and physical surroundings that nurture them. So biosphere is not only these animals, plants, bacteria, birds, fish, even their habitat also is a part of the biosphere like I would say a jungle is biosphere. A river is a part of the biosphere, not the water inside river, that is a part of the hydrosphere, but river concept that is a biosphere. And this biosphere is a testament to the planet's remarkable interconnectedness. Everything is connected inside this biosphere. So this illustrates how every organism, no matter how small, plays a role in this larger ecosystem. It underscores the delicate balance of life on earth and the importance of 
preserving this interconnected system for the benefit of all living beings again just look at this slide so you know this biosphere plays a multifaceted role crucial to our planet's equilibrium see the, the energy flow the water cycle the energy cycle the carbon dioxide cycle nitrogen cycle must have seen everything is a cyclic thing the changes form goes back again then it comes back the changes form and in that uh, cycle of changing its form it feeds so much of uh, the, uh, of these plants animals and humans so it recycles vital nutrients it regulates atmospheric gases and it forms fertile soils and a generous provision of life sustaining resources like food water and medicine is possible because of the activities of in this biosphere so without the biosphere's intricate mechanisms life as we know would not be sustainable or it will not be possible even forget about the sustaining it it will not even originate life as we know it today so within its folds an astonishing array of organisms ranging from minuscule bacteria to majestic animals they coexist and interact in various intricate ways so these interactions drive essential processes like you must have uh, heard the names of photosynthesis respiration decomposition something like that or and they all like the all these processes they form the foundation on which all life on this earth relies now this biosphere is not a constant uh, physical uh, structure we know it's an ever evolving system like our planet is uh, ever it, it, it is it has evolved to its present state and it will keep on evolving evolution has not stopped it will keep on going the never ending story so biosphere is also transforming through billions of years so even the life forms inside the biosphere they are also uh, getting more diverse and more evolved sometimes i wonder after million of years or after say 10 millions of years or or, or after such a huge life, how would humans being look like we don't know i can't even project in my mind how will our children they will become so this transformation is influenced by numerous factors like geology geological processes climate changes human actions they all uh, will affect this uh, evolution or transformation and as the biosphere continues to adapt and respond to its surroundings it underscores the complex interplay between life and the environment highlighting the importance of preserving its intricate web of existence for future generations environmental sustainability we know anything we do will have a effect in the whole universe it's a law it's a law action equal to react we don't know so we have to evolve our processes including our industrial processes and our life processes which should be able to sustain this environment for our future generations and their welfare now another aspect of uh, this biological universe is the surprising law of natural selection we have uh, heard of this law this is simple like uh, somehow this because this environment and everything is changing so there are some life forms they just become misfit to remain into that uh, environment so they are just wiped out this is a law this there is no exception in that thing so this is called law of natural selection and it leads to the evolution of a single cell primitive uh, some a bacteria type cell millions of years ago and this law of natural selection has led to the evolution of that single cellular organisms into such complex differentiated multicellular organisms like body of present 
human beings be and do all so all biological forms both plants and animals are in constant flux of evolution you should never forget that many of them have learned to understand the importance of mutual cooperation naturally they know we have to cooperate with each other to evolve further to sustain to remain alive and they have created something what we call it symbionts so there is a symbiotic relation to increase to increase the probability of survival in an environment and environment we know there is a competition for nutrients and space sometimes what we feel that in on an individual basis single handedly will not be able to survive so we join hands with another uh, life form and we make a symbiont something like marriage an individual knows that he or she will not be able to survive in this society the way they want to survive so they get married so they in a in a lighter vein pun intended that a marriage is a symbiont so don't take it uh, seriously it's just a joke to give you further concept into this process of symbiosis you see you know you must have heard the name of uh, mitochondria inside our cells so body has got cells cells have got mito something called mitochondria and they are the battery of our uh, life they are the Uh, power generator so mitochondria actually they are the power house of our cell without the mitochondria we will not have any energy to to do anything like so scientists have concluded that these mitochondria they were bacteria once upon a time they are very tiny bacteria and our primitive life forms they got infected with this mit this bacteria they went inside our cells and realized that these two individuals can help each other they formed a symbiont the cell gave nutrition to that small bacteria and bacteria in return gave atp the energy uh, packed currency to that cell to perform its function and it remained inside so mitochondria who were once a separate life forms as bacteria have become our essential cell organelle now so it's a typical case of how this process of symbiosis in this biological universe helping each other life form helping each other have led to evolution of more complex life forms now some host and symbionts have facultative relationships means they are not dependent on each other for survival but in some conditions like uh, they they need each other like for example uh, these legume plants the from where we get dals so in their roots there is a bacteria called rhizobia species so in their roots they have got these bacteria these bacteria they fix environmental free this in environment there is nitrogen gas available in soil also there is uh, air so it has got nitrogen gas this plant cannot take that nitrogen gas the nitrogen gas has to be what we call fixed i'm just giving an example of a facultative relationship that this plant needs nitrogen in the form of complex molecule to make its proteins and other hormones so nitrogen can be given to this plant the nitrogen may be available to this plant in the form like suppose we we put urea urea is another nitrogen uh, giving compound to plants so plant can have uh, other ways to survive but these bacteria also which has taken shelter in the roots of the plant and plant provide them good food and nutrition and shelter to these bacteria and in return these bacteria have got a power of making Uh, this free nitrogen available in the air which is available in the soil into its complex nitrogenous compounds which in turn are being used to make proteins by this plant so this is another relation of a symbiont this is called facultative relationship Ki even for survival they don't require these thing but still as part of the luxury they are helping each other so there are another, other examples of tube worms or uh, leaf op- opus 
something like that for vitamin biosynthesis. So this is another example of uh, like how nature, uh, in nature there are many organisms, they are trying to help each other for their survival. But it is not always helping each other. Life forms are compatible with each other, agreed. But uh, is there any other uh, aspect of uh, this uh, interaction with uh, mutual interaction of various life forms? Yes, there is another uh, interaction which they don't help basically, sometimes they damage. Just to give you a peek into the history, like uh, we know the microscope, it was invented by Dr. Hans Lippershey. And uh, when Robert Hooke, he did his early experiments and Robert Hooke and Robert Koch. So we came to know that microorganisms could lead to various diseases in humans. But even before we could even acknowledge the presence of microorganisms in this biosphere, they have been used to cause harm and gain competitive advantage to the opponents and adversaries since time immemorial. They were called ghosts, supernatural power, bad air or a curse. You know, the even meaning of malaria, malaria, like bad air. Malaria is caused by a microorganism. This is a protozoa, malarial parasite. It's called malarial parasite, plasmodium in biological language. But its name was malaria because people thought that it is because of bad air, the presence of bad air around you. So malaria, the name was found. So I just, I am drawing your attention to another fact of the biological universe that most of the time these biological forms seem to be helping each other for survival. But on the other hand, they, yes, they seem to be even damaging each other or sometimes killing each other. And uh, by the way, what is the meaning of a microorganism? A microorganism is a, any independent life form. It is too small to be viewed by our unaided eyes like bacteria, protozoa, archaea and some fungi and algae. And uh, see you, uh, I just want to make one point clear here that viruses and prions are not viewed as living entities. So they are usually kept outside the definition of microorganisms. These life forms require a special magnifying apparatus such as simple compound or an electron microscope to see them. So microorganism or microbes, what are they? Now we know the microorganism is an independent life form, too small to be viewed by the unaided eye. Without any other equipment, our eye cannot see them. And we keep, I will repeat, we keep viruses away from the definition of microorganism. We don't include them into the definition because they are not independent life forms. So, okay. So what are various types of biological life forms and uh, what are the derivatives of these life forms which can be used as uh, biological agents or bioagents or biowarfare agents like uh, the list is long. In a nutshell anything with, with the origin from a life form or life form itself if it is used to affect the health of humans plants, agriculture, livestock or natural resources, it is termed as a bioagent. So like snake venom, if snake venom, we take snake venom from a snake and inject into somebody, it, may, it could be fatal. So now this, in this case, snake venom is a bioagent. Even though it's a chemical, we know snake venom is a chemical, it, it has got a chemical formula, it's a long chemical formula of protein, but even if it is a chemical, we will call it as bioagent only because it is taken out from a biological form and what that biological form is a snake, is a poisonous snake. It could be karat, it could be some uh, viper, it could be cobra, like that. So 
if it is from a biology like uh, bee venom so honey bee somebody takes out the bee venom from it it is used as a medicine of course but some people they are allergic to bee venom so if they get bee sting they will die so there are some conspiracy theories that fellow knew that this particular person is allergic to bee venom and he wanted to kill him so he took him to a place where there lot of bee hives were there he like irritated those agitated those bees and the bees they stung both of them one of them died but actually it was a murder so we'll we'll say this was a biological assassination attack by biological processes so just to just to repeat just to remind you if i ask you bacteria is a friend or foe but you know you already know now that no life is possible without bacteria and 10% of our body weight is because of bacteria so they are most of the time they are friends but uh, they are uh, sometimes they are our enemies also now another term virus virus uh, i just told you like the small fragment of nuclear material with a protein coat is the basic structure is neither alive nor dead and it can remain viable in this form for decades and centuries permafrost we know the, the perpetual uh, ice caps on over our earth poles north pole and south pole and, and surrounding that area arctic and antarctic zone the there, there was there is uh, this uh, ice uh, frozen for say thousands maybe 20 30 thousands of years the ice has been frozen there so those small life forms are already frozen so now it is the, this permafrost is melting because of uh, global warming and these life forms are getting released into sea water so this is another concern for biological universe that those life forms which are already there embedded in permafrost they are still viable they are still alive and if it is a virus is 100% active can could be active even today so what effect would it uh, cause on our present our present life forms which has already evolved in past 20 30 000 of years like humans in the present form animals birds aquatic animals in the present forms all these uh, life forms when they will come into the contact with these primitive life forms which were embed which were frozen for thousands of years in permafrost what would happen would there be a symbiotic relationship or there will be a relationship of a parasite and host with nobody knows okay so these viruses once they are inside the appropriate cell we call that a target cell like cold virus targets our uh, respiratory system hepatitis virus it targets our uh, liver cells something like that so these viruses they can go into this target cells and they use this machinery the of that cell itself to grow and multiply because all our cells are multiplying most of our cells if not all they are multiplying so these viruses they go inside those cells they attach to that machinery inside the cells which leads to the multiplication of these cells and with that machinery piggy backing that machinery they themselves also multiply this in turn damages and disrupts the cell so that is how these viruses they cause even if we consider them as not living neither living nor dead but still they can create a lot of diseases now another life form microorganism is fungus like bacteria these fungi are all pervasive everywhere you can find them they are found in human body in environment air water plants jungles oceans lakes mountains etc they help in decomposing the organic matter in nature and also cause many diseases due to their decomposing or rotting behavior they feed on dead so they they somehow they want dead material around themselves so they always they feed on dead tissue so that's why because and we all know the outermost part of our skin is a dead layer of skin so there's why there are so many skin infection by these fungus now there's another uh, so called life forms we call them prions 
these these are just misfolded proteins protein molecules protein is a big molecule so it folds onto itself it sometimes make it will make a very complex uh, helical structure sometimes three dim like it is a folded molecule so if the protein molecule with the same chemical formula is misfolded in some other direction it could lead to form formation of a molecule what we call as prions so these misfolded protein molecules could lead to some very slow diseases of our nervous system our brain we call neurodegenerative diseases slowly 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 they will start damaging our brain and its processes memory thinking processes con- brain controlling mechanisms and it will be such a slow and ins- insidious onset that they can devastate a population over a long period of time then there are uh, toxins so what these toxins are molecules derived from other life forms like uh, there could be some bacteria fungus plants or animals from where these complex molecules are derived and they are called toxins because they affect our health if we are exposed to them and uh, they are in uh, loose language we call them poisons from these plants and uh, life forms but the technical term is toxin and just to give you how potent these toxins could be i i just tell you if i ask you which one is the most lethal substance on the earth you may say cyanides potassium cyanide or uh, some will say snake poison or something like that but i'll just i'll just tell you the most lethal substance on earth is a toxin that is called botulinum toxin which is a product of uh, one of the bacteria then other derivatives venoms and poisons example b or vas venom can be harvested if injected into i just i told you that it, it is injected into sensitive individuals it can kill in minutes many chemicals derived from fungus are hallucinogenic and if given to someone they can lead to abnormal perception and a delusional state so people may perceive the person as as a madman if his food is laced with a fungal toxin now there will be some terms which will be very frequently we will be using when we are describing the biological uh, aspect of cbrn so let us familiarize ourselves with those words and definitions because unless we know the meaning of these simple words we may not be able to understand the biological or related information now there are two very closely related words and most of us they confuse between the meaning of these two and we use them interchangeably it's not like that so one is biosafety second is biosecurity you all should understand these two uh, uh, words biosafety and biosecurity they speak of our capabilities they speak of our policies they speak of our habits and practices so as far as biological domain is concerned if we are using our capabilities systematically to prevent a biological accident accident which is unintentional we'll use the word biosafety what biosafety practices we are in like uh, so we all scientists when we work in our biological labs we use our biosafety cabinets and other biosafety practices so that is because we for want to prevent an accidental leak or accidental damage of these bioagents so that is biosafety but if we are using our capability our knowledge our wisdom and our related policies and practices to prevent an intentional or a negligent release of these bioagents then it becomes our biosecurity like if we start suspecting that there could be some negligence the way the people are handling these biological agents or there could be some sabotage or there could be some intentional attack so we use our system to make ourselves immune against those things it means we are now doing biosecurity of the system 
now another word bioterrorism the concept of bioterrorism here again we can say if there is no intention to do harm it is not bioterrorism for example if an irresponsible person suffering from covid-19 may spread it to others if he or she is not following the protocol of isolating himself or herself from others even though the person spreads a biological disease it's not a case of bioterrorism but if intentionally one does this thing then we can term the person as a bioterrorist weaponization when we term a bioagent as a bioweapon so it has to meet certain criteria the criteria of the processes which are involved to purify it to size it properly to stabilize and to make bioagents optimized for dissemination so in nutshell we understand that process of weaponization is a technology savvy process involving in depth knowledge of biology biotechnology and chemistry just simply coughing over somebody in even intentionally to spread a disease does not mean that person has used a bioweapon person may have used a is body secretions infected with viruses but to call it a weapon the, the germ the virus bacteria fungus toxin anything the germ the, the scientist has to purify that thing to concentrate it then size it properly in a in a particular size so that uh, that becomes uh, easily to disseminate then stabilize it so that it, it may not become ineffective after some time one one may procure some spores of a, of a bacteria and after say about 6 months or 1 year if they are not stabilized properly they may be dead so there should be biotechnological processes involved to stabilize it and then there should be a, a device it has to be packed into a device which can disseminate it device, device may be just a pressurized canister or uh, or some uh, spray device something like that so all these processes one has to purify make a size of the individual particle appropriate stabilize the agent and then a device is made in if a biological threat meets all these four criteria we can safely call it a biological weapon and a biological agent there are many names bioagent biological threat agent biological warfare agent bio warfare agent biological even by weapon sometimes loosely they are called but it, this has to uh, meet all those criteria which i have told you in the previous slide so this is that particular life form or the derivative of that life form in that by weapon that is a biological agent it could be a bacteria a virus protozoa parasite fungus chemical or toxin so sometime people confuse that there was a terrorist who spread a biological weapon in a community so the terrorist was a, an agent so terrorist was a biological agent no the thing which he has spread is the biological agent terrorist is not an biological agent another word bio defense now bio defense is the total collective effort of a nation to improve national defenses against biological attacks program which uh, in which you are sitting and i am giving this lecture is also a part of the bio defense our country is trying to disseminate appropriate information to make people more like to make them uh, to give a better understanding against how to tackle with these threats and uh, these probable attacks if is god forbid if they happen so this is also a part of the bio defense uh, activity but bio defense is huge as uh, this slide shows there are many many uh, stages where like we can prevent a bio attack you can prepare against uh, you yeah, you can make you prepare to make yourself resilient against a, a bio weapon then how do would you respond if a bio attack happens how will you recover if that uh, after that response the Our, our society needs to recover from its effect so all those uh, things then situational awareness uh, of uh, of 
this thing so all these things all these uh, activities they come under the umbrella of a single word that is called bio defense and the word bio war or bio warfare if a bio weapon is used in any war to any traditional war they are fighting with explosives they are fighting with guns they are fighting with cannons they are fighting with fighter jets or there are uh, other ship and destroyers they are recruited the navy is recruited the air force is the army is everything they are doing even once any of the involved party uses a bio agent it will be immediately termed as a bio warfare so don't forget if it is a bio agent involvement up to any extent we call that war as bio warfare another commonly used term of for a for a bio agent is a pathogen pathogen is simple all these pathogens are they are microorganism which can cause disease so all these pathogens have a potential to be used as bio weapon so simple a pathogen is a pathogen we have termed a pathogen for a, nor, a naturally occurring organism in the nature like there are some parasites i have given you example of malarial parasite the fungus i have given you example of like the fungus causing skin diseases then there are bacteria they can cause uh, tuberculosis virus like causing aids or uh, hepatitis or even covid 19 all these microorganisms are collectively terms as pathogens and these pathogens have a potential to be used as bio agents now some pathogens they can easily change their uh, main host A disease of like they they can easily uh, survive in in any of th- any of the animals or uh, in human beings body so if that if a disease of an animal which spreads to human beings is called zoonotic zoonotic disease so zoonotic disease is uh, an opportunistic uh, infection for example you have you must have seen some dogs they are suffering from uh, scabies so they itch a lot their hair if they fall down so they become bald so that is infective that is called scabies so human beings who come into the co- contact with these dogs they can get uh, that same uh, disease so other examples are we have seen bird flu we have seen swine flu or salmonellosis or typhoid fever or tapeworm infections so these are some examples of how diseases which are primarily really primarily the diseases of animals even humans can get infected with these diseases so these diseases are called zoonotic diseases another term that is called uh, wmd or weapon of mass destruction it's a generic term we know weapons of mass destruction is in the explosive field also weapon of mass destruction is in the nuclear field also weapon of mass destruction can be chemical weapon similarly weapon of mass destruction can be a biological weapon also which can which has got the capacity and capability to kill many and most of the live agents of bio warfare are weapons of mass destruction you should understand it as because they can spread to many and they are self propagating in the society to spread them nothing else is required they themselves will propagate they will multiply and will spread to other uh, people another word that is called virulence so virulence or potency is like the degree of an organism to cause disease in simple words more virulent an organism more lethal it is but remember the objective of a bioterrorist may not be to develop or use the most virulent organisms understand this sometimes fastest spreading but less virulent virulent bio agents they can do the trick trick of spreading panic overrun the healthcare facilities and disrupt the system which is the primary objective of a bio terrorist another word 
incubation period like the time between acquiring infection and appearance of the first symptom of a disease so it's something like lead time unfortunately many diseases become infectious even in their incubation period so person has got infection person is not showing any symptom of the disease no sign no symptom no fever no sore throat no body aches nothing person is fit and fine but person has already got the infection person is in incubation period but many diseases can be infectious in that stage too this means just because a person doesn't have symptom of a disease it doesn't mean that the person cannot spread disease to others that's why mask guidelines of using a mask even when you don't have a cough and keeping the distance of 2 meters was universally propagated to be used while the pandemic was on now biological toxin again biological toxin a hazardous to health chemical which originates from a biological form maybe microorganism like a bacteria or fungus or a plant or an animal one example is ricin ricin which is extracted from castor seeds such toxins are lethal in their microgram quantity such toxins are not live they are not self propagating but they are very lethal and that's why since they they don't spread to others they are preferred agents for targeted assassination by a bioterrorist another word we call it the word is called differential diagnosis very commonly used word so differential diagnosis like there may, could be a bunch of people having the similar sign and symptom all may be having fever all may be having sore throat all may be having body aches all may be having watering eyes but there would be a list of various probable diagnoses which they each are suffering from this list is called differential diagnosis maybe they are suffering from uh, influenza virus a they may be suffering from influenza virus b they may be suffering from covid infection they may be suffering from streptococcal throat infection we don't know so all there may be a bunch of diseases these are uh, this list is called a list of differential diagnosis another example like a person comes with fever high fever it could be malaria it could be urine infection it could be chest infection it could be septicemia it could could be influenza anything so these probable diagnosis they come under the list of differential diagnosis prophylactic treatment as the name suggest it is for prophylaxis or for prevention of a disease it's a general medical treatment which a person takes most of the time after the exposure to to a to a biological agent but even before exposure like when we travel to some high risk zone where the malaria is there so they, they start uh, a prophylactic dose of chloroquine if somebody is traveling into a, a place where there is endemic or high prevalence of malaria so that is called prophylactic treatment and uh, this uh, treatment goes till that person stays in that area and ends after he comes back another name that is called symptom now there are related words symptom and there is another word sign which i will explain in uh, next slide but symptom is the problem which is faced by a person the problem which person comes to a doctor and tells ki doctor i have got fever i have got headache i have got loose motions or my particular limb is not working i have got paralysis i have got chest pain i have got difficulty in breathing or i have got some swelling it describes of a swelling or discoloration something like that so symptoms is a patient language which a patient tell to a medical professional and on the other hand sign word the sign is what is observed by that medical fraternity or a doctor 
person with fever the doctor may find out that throat is congested or there is an infection somewhere so that congested throat becomes a sign a person with just body aches a doctor may not temperature and find out that he has got fever in this case this fever becomes a sign because it is measured by the medical doctor and patient didn't know so in other words if a patient describes that he or she has got fever it is a symptom but when he or she is told by someone after measuring body temperature that he or she has got fever it becomes a sign of a disease another uh, word is called culture medium plural is culture media these are small usually typically there could be a bottle there could be some a she- a plain sheet of paper but typically it's a rounded glass petri dish filled with a nutrient rich mix and that mix is selected in a way that it only facilitates the growth of a particular specific strain of microorganism and inhibits the other microorganisms growth so that is to make uh, try to prevent some uh, infections or to make pure strain of uh, that microorganism and these culture medium they are used by laboratory people microbiologists medical team and they are used to diagnose and demonstrate the presence and type of typically of course for virus and fungus uh, they are used but typically they are used for bacteria for small amount of sample taken from the body of a person so like urine the person may be having a symptom of passing frequent urine after every certain 15 minutes with burning sensation so that symptom person will come to a medical doctor doctor will see the urine is cloudy or so and will that is a sign cloudy urine is a sign and will because it is noted by medical doctor not by patient and uh, doctor will measure the body temperature maybe temperature is slightly high again the high fe- uh, temperature of the body or fever is a sign and then doctor takes that sample and put the drop of uh, urine into a culture medium to see if some bacteria grows in that so that is a culture medium so that is end of part 1 of uh, biological universe the topic of biological universe so next time we'll cover the second and the final part of this topic of biological universe thank you thank you so much